Thank you for joining me today. I'm gonna to be going over selling your food items online and we're going to um, talk about selling foods in just Hawaii and then also to the mainland and other watch outs for you all. And um, while I'm speaking, this is a two hour session. We may have a break depending on how, how you all are doing. And um, if you have any questions, put in the chat, the Q&A and I'll try my best to answer it that your questions during the presentation, as well as if I miss it, then I'll be after the presentation. Okay. So a little bit about me. I'm a food scientist by training and education, um, certified culinary scientist. So I have a background in nutrition, food science, and culinary arts, and a certified food scientist by the Institute of Food Technologists. I'm a lead instructor for FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act Preventive Controls for Human Food, which some of you may have already taken. Uh, I'm also a serve safe instructor and proctor. So if you need like food handling for food service, I, I teach that class. I teach at Kapilani Community College. So I teach the sanitation and safety course there. And I'm a lead instructor for HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points and trained in the foreign supplier verification program. So if you do uh, import different ingredients or foods that you sell uh, from other countries, then there's other information that you need to know about when you are importing foods to make sure that they're safe. And eventually with HTDC, we're planning to offer that foreign supplier verification program to probably late this year um, once I am a lead instructor on that course, which should be in a couple of months. Okay. So I just want to have some introductions from everyone. I see that we have quite a few participants. And if you can, just tell me quickly your name, the company name, what products you sell, and if you currently sell your products online. And um, I've been doing this thing with my family. We're talking about one thing we're grateful for every day. So if you want to share one thing you're grateful for. And so um, I'm grateful for this from this weekend that my husband cleaned the house. Well, not all of it, but a large portion of it. So I'm very grateful that he um, cleaned out a closet and near our, um, the doorway. So, yeah. okay. Uh, does any, I can go down this list and if you're not on, it's okay, but I, I'm going to go down the participant list just for some quick introductions. Uh, I hey, uh, Lauren, oh. sorry, this is Ellen. We are actually in webinar mode, so people can't turn on their microphones. So oh, if they can't. You want them, they cannot. So if you want them to give responses, they have to leave it in chat. Okay, so never mind. Oh, I'm sorry, chat. I didn't yeah. know we're in webinar mode. That's okay. So um, we'll just go from there. And I, I think my, my presentation is pretty comprehensive on different stages you may be in your, in your business. So we're going to start from people that might even be making foods in your home kitchen and then next steps there and there. So uh, let's see. Just... Okay, so we'll move on there. So today uh, we're gonna start by talking about if you are producing foods in your kitchen at home, direct sales to customers, what you need to know what's required for your food items and what regulations are required then moving on to if you are making your food in Hawaii in a commercial kitchen and then you start having indirect sales. So direct sales is when you are physically the one selling it to a customer and you have direct interaction. It's pretty much you're handing over food from yourself to a person. Indirect sales are like say you're selling your food to a distributor who is now selling it to someone else or you're selling your food item to a store like Safeway and then now safely selling it, that's indirect sales. Or if you are selling it online and someone's purchasing your product online and you're shipping it away, now that is now considered indirect sales too. Um, telling you a little bit about local sales, just Hawaii, you're, you're just based in Hawaii, selling it to people who live in Hawaii. And then moving on to interstate sales, so selling to the mainland and um, there are specific rules for California, so we're going to be talking a little bit about that and then just briefly going over international sales too, because for international sales, 
it's specific to the country that you're selling to. Okay, so Hawaii home kitchen local sales. So for people who are selling their, their food, um, if you're making your food in your home kitchen at home, then you fall under um, Hawaii Department of Health standards. So just some definitions too before we begin. A homemade food operation, it's a person that produces or packages homemade food products only in your home kitchen, okay? And so you live in that house, that's your kitchen that you're probably cooking your own food for your, for your family in. Um, a homemade food product is a food that is not a potentially hazardous food, okay? So you are only allowed to produce certain types of food from your home kitchen. And it's usually ones that are safe or dry and are not going to hurt or harm someone because of certain time or temperatures that are necessary to hold the food or to, to cook it. Um, potentially hazardous foods, a food that requires time or temperature control for safety to limit foodborne illnesses. So potentially hazardous foods cannot be made in your home kitchen and then sold to people. So even something like pickling foods, you are not supposed to pickle foods from your own home kitchen and sell it. And I know during COVID, a lot of people were selling foods on Facebook or Instagram, and that if, if it was a potentially hazardous food, it was not, it's not allowed. Okay, so if you are selling a food out of your home and it's a low risk food item, what you need, what's required by the Hawaii State Department of Health is um, you need to have some kind of food safety training. And so it could be from the Department of Health. So our Hawaii State Department of Health offers a free food handlers training class. And so you can go to their website and they offer trainings. Some During COVID, it was online. I think they started going back to the in-person uh, trainings and it's a couple of hours long and then you have a certificate. And so at least one person who is in the kitchen will have to have that food safety training. Um, there are other ways to get this food training certificate. The Department of Health recognizes this American National Standards Institute, ANSI. And so there are different online programs that you can participate in. It's a couple hours long, and then you can get a food handler certificate from someone there, some online training class. And then also there is the Serve Safe Food Handler Certificate. And so some students in high school take a food handler certificate exam and then they have a certificate or here at Kapilani Community College when students pass this sanitation and safety class and they take this exam they have the food safety managers certificate and so that certificate could be used in place of like the department of health one because it has more information more regulated um, it's like a higher standard training and certificate so um, if you have that, that's allowed too. If you're making foods at home, again, it should be low risk food items, um, packaged food items, and you are selling the foods directly from yourself to the consumer. Okay. Let's see, let's see if anyone has questions. Um, does this apply to New York? Someone asked. Um, Every state has different rules. So this is primarily, we're gonna focus on Hawaii. And if you're, if you're making food in New York, you would have to look at their regulations because different states have, it's called cottage food laws. And in Hawaii, we actually don't have any cottage food, food laws. We just have some regulations or guidance. And so New York might be a little different, but it is state specific. Um, can you share information where we can take the training? Uh, yeah, I will add that. I'm going to write a list, a running list of things I need. So I can include links or maybe LN folks can send a follow-up email with links to the training. So I know if you just Google Department of Health Hawaii Food Safety Training, something will pop up and you can see the web, uh, the, the dates that they offer this training. Yeah, and that one's free. Uh, okay. 
okay, so what can you make at home in Hawaii for our rolls? So you're allowed to make from your house um, breads, rolls, mochi, surprisingly, um, like Japanese sticky rice cakes, uh, cakes, cookies, pastries, candies and confections, jams, jellies, and preserves, cereals, trail mixes, granola, and popcorn. And so it's basically drier foods. And when I'm saying like cakes, cookies, and pastries, these are drier products. You're not, if you make pastries that are filled with custard, then that wouldn't apply because the custard would probably have to be um, refrigerated. But I will be, I'll be going over some food safety concerns and how you can test to see if that pastry could be sold. But basically, if you're making a cheesecake, that wouldn't apply. I know it says cakes, but cheesecake has to be refrigerated. If not, it's going to spoil without refrigeration. So that kind of food would not, you would not be able to make it at home and sell it. So anything that needs refrigeration would not be able to be made at home. Cream puffs, no, it's filled with like a pastry filling, wouldn't, wouldn't fly. Okay, so how do you make safer food? And so you make safer food by this acronym called Fat Tom. So each letter stands for something. So um, bacteria, pathogenic bacteria, like your salmonella, E. coli, listeria, all of that bacteria need certain things to grow. And the ones that can cause food like sickness, like vomiting and, and diarrhea, these bacteria need certain conditions. And so for bacteria to grow, it needs a food, usually high in carbohydrates or proteins. And so any food that you're making has that food available for microbial growth. Uh, acidity. So in, in general, foods, foods don't like super acidic conditions. And so if you think like vinegar, nothing really grows in vinegar because it's so acidic. It's when you eat foods that are acidic, it's kind of like sour. And so um, food doesn't grow in low acid conditions. And a low acid means, uh, I'm sorry, foods don't grow in a high acid condition. And so that's a low pH. So uh, if, if you go back to your high school chemistry, a pH that is um, seven is neutral, water is like a seven. So a pH of like 4.6 is probably safer. So you wanna keep it more acidic and, and bacteria won't grow. So sometimes when people formulate foods, they're adding in citric acid to it to make it more acidic. Um, time and temperature. So if you keep foods out for a long period of time, um, more bacteria tends to grow. So if it's not in the refrigerated, say there's a food like a cheesecake and you leave it out, the longer it's out, the more bacteria is going to grow in it. Um, temperature. So in general, there's something called the temperature danger zone and that, that temperature between 40 and um, like 39, 40 and 140, around there 35. Um, so that temperature danger zone Bacteria loves to grow. And so you want to, if you have a certain food, you want to make sure that the food is below, sorry, it's 41 degrees, or you want to make sure it's higher so that bacteria doesn't have a chance to grow. And so a lot of times certain other foods need to be refrigerated or frozen to minimize growth of bacteria. And then oxygen, um, in general, most bacteria, they don't, um, they need oxygen to, most bacteria need oxygen to grow. So if you take out the oxygen in your food item, then there's less chance for bacteria growth. Although there are some bacteria that like no oxygen. And so um, that one's iffy depending on what bacteria you're, you're concerned about. And then lastly, uh, moisture. So bacteria loves moisture. They like water to survive. So if your product is drier, there's less of a chance for bacterial growth. Um, so the syrup, someone asked a question, the syrup fall under jam? Possibly, I think you could make syrups at home depending on if you um, 
what the water activity is of your syrup and how you're bottling it because different it, it depends sorry a lot of these products it depends on the the um, properties of your food item and does honey apply to this category um the category of going back to foods made at home um i don't know if honey that's a good question i I don't know who would make honey at home, but honey is relatively safe. I have to ask the Department of Health for that one. I don't know who would, I guess, repackage honey at home. Someone asked the question, does honey apply to this category of safe foods? Um, possibly because it's low risk, but I think it would depend. Um, yeah. How do we figure the shelf life and does a syrup with citric acid need to be in the refrigerator? Okay, so I'm gonna answer those questions in the next um, few slides here. Okay, so can you make this food at home? So if your water activity is less than 0.85, then your food is less likely to be contaminated with pathogenic bacteria. And so water activity is the amount of free water available for bacteria growth. And so if I had this water activity scale is from zero to one. So a cup of water with nothing in it would have a water activity of one. Foods that spoil quickly in just room temperature have a high water activity like 0.95 to one. So something like meat, um, cut fruit, it will spoil if you leave it out. Um, those have high water activities, things like when you're eating it, you know that there's just a lot of water in it. Um, something like crackers and cookies would have a water activity of about 0.4. Uh, I don't know much of things that are really at zero. And so um, there's machines that test your water activity. And so you can run it and it determines how much water is available and not bound to sugars or salts or pectin. And so the question about um, jams or, or syrups, if there's a lot of sugar in your syrup, then this water activity might actually be lower because the water is not free for bacterial growth. It's bound to sugar, so it's not available for the bacteria to, to use. So something like jams and jellies and even honey, there's so much sugar in those products that those pathogenic bacteria are not gonna grow in it. So um, your syrups that you're making, someone asked a question about syrups. Um, if it's super syrupy, like think maple syrup, um, even the, what do you call it? Like fake maple syrup, like pancake syrup, those have such a high, um, a low water activity, there's so much sugar in it that uh, I don't think you have to keep it in the fridge unless once you open it. Okay. Uh, oh, I think my question disappeared. Ah, okay. Uh, and so something, and then to think about it too, like soy sauce, show you that looks really watery, right? It looks like you can, you can pour it. Um, it's, but surprisingly, that water activity is low also because there's so much salt bound to the water. So there's never ever really pathogenic growth in soy sauce because there's so much salt in the product. So if you are formulating, depending on what kind of food, you could try to bump up the amount of salt in your formulation or sugar, and that might reduce your water activity. Okay. Uh, this doesn't mean that things can't still grow in it. So some of you who eat jams and jellies or honey, if say your kid sticks a, a butter knife into the honey, puts it on toast, and now toast crumbs go back into that honey jar or, or your jam jar, or maybe they touch it with their finger, other things can still grow in it because once it's open, you contaminated your food. So all that goes out the window. But if you're selling like a packaged food item, um, if your water activity is low, you go through the proper handling procedures, then nothing should really grow in it. Um, something else to note for this water activity, this is this less than 0.85 is for pathogenic bacteria. So molds and yeasts could still grow in your food if below 0.85. Just letting you know. But, okay. 
Uh, then we kind of mentioned acidity. So someone asked a question about um, citric acid and if they added citric acid to their syrup. If your pH is below 4.6, then yes, your product would be shelf stable. So you're looking at pH levels too. Okay. Um, other ways you can try to make your food more stable would be adding preservatives to your food. And so this could be like chemicals that right now it's not that trendy to put in chemical sounding ingredients into your foods, or it could be preservatives like citric acid, you're acidifying and it's in some food items, it's considered a preservative. Salts are considered preservatives in some foods too. So it's still not a chemical per se, but it's adding to, to um, increase your shelf life or make it more stable. Other things you can do are heat treatment. So with your jams and jellies that you're making, you're heat treating it, heating your foods to a high enough temperature so that um, it's killing off the bacteria. Uh, different kinds of packaging could prevent uh, growth of bacteria. So most bacteria don't like oxygen. So if you flush out the oxygen with another chemical like nitrogen, uh, that could help uh, make your product a little bit more stable. And also when in doubt, refrigeration and freezing your food, it's not gonna kill the bacteria, but it's gonna slow down the growth of it. So uh, those are also options. And what I like to tell people is that the more ways you try to minimize bacteria, the safer the product you can make. So I know that's not always the case, but if I'm making a product, I wanna try to see, can I, get my pH low enough and then can I heat treat it so that at least if my pH somehow fails, at least my heat treatment helped to make this product safe. And so uh, this is just a chart and then the next page has a chart too. So these are just good rules of thumb values for water activity and pH, but then there's also, if you compare pH levels to higher water activities or higher pH levels to higher water activities, there's ways that you can make safer food. So for example, if the water activity is over, um, is about 0.88 or a little bit less, your pH, if it's lower, like lower than 4.6 at 4.2, that would still be a safe product even though your water activity is higher. So this is good. Where do we test water activity and safety if I need to disclose? To, um, Okay, so someone asked a question of where do you test water activity and safety uh, if you need to disclose it to people. And so for this case, you I, I know there's a couple labs in Hawaii where you can go and send your product in for water activity testing. Um, and then you would get your lab data and then you could show it to your customers if they ask for it. I know some companies here in Hawaii, they do have their own water activity meter. And so they run tests too, but um, you are running your own tests. So if someone wants the data, you can say, this is what we test, but having it from a third party, <laughs> someone else is, is more proof that you, you know they did it right. But I, I know a few companies, they run water activity just to know from a quality standpoint on their food, are they hitting the right um, drying of their food item or cook times and cook temperatures to, to produce a, a safe food. Um, is canning considered heat treatment? Yes, canning is considered heat treatment. And um, canning falls in a different category. I'm really, disclaimer, there's a lot of regulation, state and federal, and um, I'm gonna try my best to answer it. And a lot of times it's, it depends on what your product is, depends on formulation. But yes, canning is considered a heat treatment. And um, then once you're canning something, you're making a, anaerobic, no oxygen condition. And so your food it now has other concerns too. So you have to make sure that you're making a safe product. And so depending on the amount of acid in your food, uh, if it's low acid, then you might have to take some other classes about low acid canned foods. Sorry, but yes, in answer to your question, yes, canning would be, most likely considered uh, heat treatment. 
Oh, great. Someone put a link in. Thanks. Okay. Okay. And so this is just information about water activity and pH. So all the may, a lot of the major bacteria that you hear of on the news, like staph, um, salmonella, E. coli, listeria. So all of these, if the pH is low enough and the water activity is low enough, um, the bacteria will not grow at, at these temperatures. Okay, so when do you need to produce your food in a commercial kitchen? So now we're moving on to, okay, if your food, you, only low risk food can be produced in your home kitchen. But if you're going to do anything like fermented food, so your kimchi, um, kombucha, uh, beer, uh, you would have to do it in a, diff a, a commercial kitchen. And this could be a shared kitchen. It's just, it, it's a separate kitchen that's not, you're not using for your home too. If you're acidifying food, so pickling foods, you're putting vinegar in, um, that would fall under the use of commercial kitchen. Dried meats and seafood, you're not allowed to dry your own meats from your own home kitchen. Uh, cheesecake, custard pies, cream filled, so anything that needs, um, you need refrigeration to keep it safe, uh, that has to be made in a commercial kitchen. Canned or bottled foods, it's kind of weird because jams and jellies were in that other, um, in, in, in the other side, but canned or bottled falls under a commercial kitchen. Uh, garlic and oil, I do not recommend you make that, but if you end up doing it, there's a lot of safety concerns because um, oil kind of coats the garlic and makes it in this, it makes it a non-oxygen or anaerobic condition. So those bottles with a lot of cloves of garlic and oil in it, that potentially could be a cause for botulism. Um, even people who are making you know, like those chili garlic oil sauces. If you're using fresh garlic, you want to make sure that um, it's cooked a lot so that you're not leaving like fresh garlic into an oil. So there's more regulations that are required for that kind of product. You can do it, but it, it takes a little bit more work and you need to go to a process authority. And um, low acid canned foods, and also pet foods. Pet foods need to be made, you can't make it from your home kitchen. Okay, so if you end up being able to make foods from your home kitchen, you have to have certain information on the label of your product. And so this is, again, this is Hawaii state rules. You have to have a wording of made in a home kitchen not routinely inspected by the Department of Health because the Department of Health does not go to your house to check out your kitchen unless there's some kind of issue that comes up like someone complains about getting sick or something something your competitor tells on you then you're going to get inspected in your home um, on your label also you need to include the common name of your product so for example I always use the example of Oreos Oreos are that's not the common name of the product. It's actually chocolate sandwich cookie, cream filled sandwich cookies. So you need a name that people understand what the product is. If you're making some kind of spicy sauce or, or you would have to, I guess you could write spicy sauce or even furikake, what we seem to all know what it is in Hawaii, you put it on rice. The common name is not furikake. It's like seasoned laver spike. Like, Slaver seasoning. So you, you need to have that common name on your label. And then um, whatever ingredients are on your food, you need to list them. And if you have more than two or more ingredients and you have to list it in descending order. So the heavy, the ingredient you use the most of by weight needs to be listed first all the way to the ingredient that you use in the smallest amount. And then also having your name or your company's name and contact information of your company. Okay, someone asked a question. I'm confirming bottling high sugar, citric acid, and containing syrups needs a commercial kitchen. Um, I think so. I, I think that one would be, but I will double check. So someone's asking about syrups. 
I will double check on that one for you. Okay. Okay, so here's an example label. If you're just making it from your home, this is what you would have to do. Say I'm making a granola because that's safe. I'm calling it yum yums. People have no idea what yum yums are. So I have to write the statement of identity, fruit and nut granola. And then I have my ingredients in ascend, descending order. So I'm going to use oats at the most, macadamia at the end. And then also it's good to have your allergens here too. So I, I wrote out even though macadamia nuts are in my ingredient statement, sometimes it's easier for people who have food aller allergies to um, see what the allergens are. So I have a contained statement here. And then I have um, made in a home kitchen, not routinely inspected by the Department of Health. And then my company's name, the address, and then contact information. So this is fake, just so you know, but um, this is what you would have to put on your food item. And so some of you might be like, so do I need a nutrition facts panel on your food that's coming from your house? Uh, no, you, you don't for the most part, but if you end up putting some kind of health claim or nutrient claim on your food item, then, um, then you need nutrition facts on it. So say you're saying low fat or gluten-free or low sodium or um, something like that you now need to put a nutrition facts label because you are putting, you now are claiming something and you need proof that it's low fat. And so the federal government has a list of definitions. So uh, a low fat item has less than five grams of fat per serving. And so you need all the nutrition facts. If you're gonna claim it on your website or if you're going to claim it um, in on the bottle or even if you're going to say you're putting out an ad in the newspaper and you say it's low fat, even if it's not necessarily on the bottle, once you start advertising these nutrient claims, health claims, you, you now need to have a nutrition facts available on your food item. Okay. Uh, you might need it if a vendor asks for one, but again, you shouldn't be selling to a vendor if you're making it out of your home. So yeah, but if you end up, if you end up expanding from your home business and selling it to someone, then a vendor might ask you, so a store might say, can I have a nutrition claim on it? Um, it also could be good for transparency. So if you want people to, there's a lot, say you have a really product that's really healthy, good for you, you might want to put it um, on your label. And then also there's rules too about how much you're selling, how much money you're making per annual sales. And that might require you to uh, have to put a label, but we'll go over these numbers in a later slide that they're, they're kind of high. Of course. So, I, mean, I don't know how much people make from their home businesses, but it's in the thousands. Okay, uh, do you need to put the weight on your package? And so um, if you're adding a weight on your package, it might be, so it is looking at it, I don't think it's required on home labels but in general once you start making a once you start putting labels on your food you do need a weight on your packaging and it's required to put it on the bottom third of your packaging on the principal display panel is the main panel of your package and then you need to use a certified scale and so um, you can't just buy a scale on amazon I learned this from the, the state. Um, you need to have a scale that is um, certified every year. And then it has to also be um, tested by companies here to make sure that their, um, your, your scale is working properly. And so there's only certain scales that can be certified. I don't have that list of scales, but I know like just buying a scale online isn't good enough. And um, so even foods that you sell at a farmer's market, if you ever go, I was trying to find that seal online for a picture, but if you ever go to the farmer's market and you're buying food by the pound, if you look on that side of those scales, there's a sticker and the state um, certifies it every year for them. So that's why I think some places that sell food at farmer's market sell food by the piece because it's not by the weight. So once you start selling food by weight, um, it's you want to make sure you're not 
cheating out your customer, you know, so you want to make sure you have a, a scale that measures the proper weight on your food. Um, if your food is a liquid, then your, your weight should be listed in fluid ounces. And also for your any weight, you also you need to have like the metric system. So grams or milliliters if it's a fluid and then um, your, I don't know if it's Americanized weight, so your ounces. So you need to have both of them uh, on, on your, your package. Okay, let's see. And then um, information on this, your the person, the, the, the department that certifies your your scale is under falls under the state of Hawaii Quality Assurance Division, and it's the Measurement Standards Branch. And so, uh, this is where you get it certified. I don't think there's it's a state certification, so you can't just get it certified online or something. You have to send it away. I mean, not send it away. You have to contact the measurements branch, and then they'll issue you the new sticker. For okay. And then um, social media sales, Hawaii guidelines. I asked one of my friends who is a food inspector, because I noticed that a lot of people sold their foods on Facebook or Instagram during uh, COVID and even before. And um, you see people, and, and a lot of businesses grew from online sales like this. And what my friend told me was that um, it can be used for advertising purposes only but the transaction has to be in person because if you're still, this is if you're making food in your house and selling it to someone. Uh, Instagram, um, Facebook, you can, you can make you know, contact with people, but the transaction of the monies, the transaction of the food should be in person. And so um, if, and say there are some people, I've seen this too, where people are selling food items made at home at their friend's restaurant. So that's technically not permitted. Um, so food establishments, that's like a restaurant or, um, yeah, a restaurant or someone that's registered, a food establishment, someone that's registered and has that placard on their wall, you know, the state, they're not allowed to sell homemade foods from someone else's kitchen in there. They can make food themselves and sell it, but you can't like sell foods for a friend in your place. Um, that's the rule by the Department of Health. And uh, if anyone needs, has questions that I didn't answer, I can try to answer them during this webinar or um, I can direct you to the Department of Health because the inspectors are nice and they don't want people to fail. They just want people to know the rules. And if you always think about food safety law and regulations as trying to, prevent illness from occurring, trying to, trying to, um, I don't want to say save the customer, but, you know, making sure that they don't get sick. That's really what the function of our state government and federal government is trying to do, like making sure people don't get sick from foods that might not be produced safely. Okay. 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 So that ends my portion about selling foods from home. To directly to people. Are there any questions on this? You can add it to the Q and A. Okay. Okay. So Hawaii indirect sales. So now we're assuming you're making your food item in a certified commercial kitchen. So now you can sell foods indirectly to people. And so for a certified commercial kitchen, you're going to need to get uh, inspection from the Department of Health. And you've seen these placards, it looks kind of different now, but a placard like this, um, someone in your kitchen your, uh, should have that food safety training that we talked about, either from the Department of Health or the ANSI, some training so you can show, show proof that you understand um, proper food handling. Your place has to be inspected. And um, when they are inspecting your kitchen, they're looking at if your food and your ingredients are stored at proper temperatures, you're cooking your cook times, temperatures are being adhered to. Uh, they're looking at your employee health. They're looking at making sure you know proper cleaning and sanitizing procedures, making sure that your facility doesn't have rodents or um, 
yeah, vermin, like you can, that's, or plumbing issues. And then also making sure that like you have a three compartment sink, you have a hand washing sink that's separate from your washing sink, you know, so they are, they have a checklist. And if you go to the, what the Department of Health website, there are um, checklists and information on how to pass the, the inspection. And you would have to do this every year. And then even if it's just every year, I noticed that the inspectors come quite more often. So even at our school here, now that COVID is kind of dying off, they've come mid-year too for our inspections for our campus. Okay, uh, I'm mainly talking about food safety regulations, but if you're starting to sell products out there, you should have, you should be a registered business, have your GE license and also liability insurance in case something does happen to someone, one of your customers and they do get sick, you wanna make sure that you have insurance. Okay, so we talked briefly about what the regulations are for the Hawaii, Hawaii state, but now we have, now that you are, uh, you're manufacturing food in a certified kitchen, now you have to ask yourself, am I a registered FDA food facility? Oh, general excise tax, someone asked, what's a general, a GE, a general excise tax? So that's basically now you, own, you have a business. So you're paying any income that, any sales that you take in, now you have to pay taxes on them. Um, that 4.5 goes up to like 4.7 can you explain when gloves and hairnets are required or it doesn't matter? Um, for that question, you should, it's just good. Um, someone asked a question, can you explain when gloves and hair, a hairnet hat are required and when it doesn't matter? Um, I personally would say you should have it whenever you're working with food. If, I mean, if there's any chance that, that, um, your hair could get into your food, then I would, it's just good of, it's just part of good manufacturing practices. Once your food is heated and cooked and there's any chance of contamination by a human, by a person, you should be gloved up and wearing a hairnet, okay? Um, you don't necessarily have to have gloves. If, say you're working with raw meat, you could, if, and it's gonna be cooked, you, or like fruit that you're cutting and it's not gonna be served fresh. You can choose not to wear gloves because there's a kill step of a heat treatment. So you wouldn't have to wear gloves then. I would still wear the hat or a hairnet because if there's a chance that hair will fall into your food, you don't want that to happen. So I wear gloves and a hairnet all the time, but sometimes if you're using, some, you know, it's hard to grab things with gloves on and you know there's gonna be a cook step after, you don't have to wear a glove. But then, so there's all these rules. If you have cuts on your hands, like a wound, and you have to cover it with a Band-Aid, then you need a glove over it because you don't want any chance of blood going onto your food item. Um, do we need Department of Health certification if we have a USDA approved facility? Um, I think, so US, someone's asking about USDA. So I'm talking about FDA. And so for USDA foods, those are foods that are, usually contain over 2% of meat or poultry or if it's eggs. And so they have different regulations, but I'm pretty certain the Department of Health has to come in too. But um, see who this is on. We can, uh, I'll ask more about your food item, but I'm pretty sure you would have to get a uh, the placard there too, if you're a food facility. Assuming, I, I would have to ask you, you can talk, I'll, I'll talk to you after, depending on what your food item is, the question. Yeah. But uh, you mentioned the product weights need to be at the bottom third of the container. I've seen some about it. Um, okay, you've seen so many bottled, someone asked a question, going back to the question about having the net weight on a food item. And they said, they've seen so many bottles with no label. Can it be on a hang tag? Uh, Technically, by the federal government, no, it's supposed to be on your label bottom and not on a hang tag. Uh, if your bottle's like super tiny and it can't fit on the label, then maybe you can get rid of, 
it can be on a hang tag, but usually there should be, if you have enough space to put a label on your product, you should be able to fit the, the weight on, on the package. So I would say it should be on the bottle. And then something to mention, we are going over these regulations, but there's no body, government body or state body organization that checks up on your labels. So yes, we have all these rules and regulations, but there's no one going to the stores and inspecting your food items. So this person asked about bottled items with no label. Yeah, you're, you're not gonna get caught. Like there's so many products out there that are incorrectly labeled. And the one way you can get in trouble is your competitors turning you in. And, or, or you're, I mean, you're, you're putting all this information for safety and to protect your customers but either some people might not know the rules, maybe it's imported in and different, there's different rules and regulations for different countries. But um, yeah, I'm gonna teach you what you should be doing by law. So I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but no, it shouldn't be on a hang tag um, for the weights. Okay. Okay, so going back to this registered FDA food facility, does this apply to you? So you don't have to register your facility if under the FDA's food facility rule if you make less than a million dollars in annual total sales. Um, so this includes, say you, you sell other things besides food. Like say you sell t-shirts, you sell bags, I don't know. This is, oh, oh sorry, I made a mistake. Sorry, take that back. This is all total food sales, I'm talking about something else. So if you make less than a million dollars in total food sales, you don't have to register. Technically. Um, if you make less than $500,000, and that's to be your average of annual sales, um, then um, you, you don't have to do it either. And this is like a three-year average. So say you, you make X amount in your annual sales and you keep increasing your sales over the next few years, they're gonna average your annual sales and then you may have to start registering as an FDA food facility. Okay. Um, something to note too, this is general rule of thumb, but since you all are here for online sales, once you do interstate sales, you now have to register as an FDA food facility regardless of how much sales you make. So I can just tell you this, but once you start selling to the mainland, you know, selling, then you have to register your food facility. Um, also, rule of thumb too, I don't know how many people get caught in it, but say you, you purchase um, from a company on the mainland. So say you're buying packaging from someplace in Nebraska. Now you have interstate sales too. Even though you're, you're purchasing items to use in Hawaii, you now fall under interstate and now you have to register your facility as an FDA food facility. But if you buy packaging from a local packaging store, who is importing it from China or importing it from, I don't know if you call it, importing it from uh, the mainland, technically you are not doing interstate commerce. Isn't that weird? I always thought it was weird. So if you're buying your ingredients from a distributor that's local, then that's not considered interstate commerce. Is that also apply if you use a third party facility? Uh, I don't know what that means. Um, can you clarify that question? Someone asked the question is that does it also apply if you use a third party facility? So um, to manufacture, if you're using so like a maybe like a coal packer so it's only specific to your product but that coal packer would probably have to register as a food facility because their annual total sales is probably over a million dollars anyway so your the coal packer should be registered as a food facility yeah in general and okay so just a little overview about some of the 
uh, about once you are registered as an FDA food facility, this food safety modernization act comes in play and, and you're required to do certain things. So just some information about it, this food safety modernization act, it's was basically formed so that we could protect our food supply and make sure that our people, consumers were not getting sick. Um, it encompasses preventive controls for human food. So all, I think most of you here are making foods for human consumption. And then it also encompasses foreign supplier verification. So if you are importing foods, different countries have different regulations. They don't follow our US regulations. So making sure any food that's coming in, is it up to our US standards? So there, this foreign supplier verification program falls under FSMA. Um, sanitary transportation. So if you are distributing or say you have vans, refrigerated vans, you're doing delivery, that falls under FSMA too. So making sure that um, your vans are clean, making sure that or vans or trucks are clean, making sure that they're keeping your foods at the right temperature, that is also something you would need to know about from the FSMA. Intentional alter, um, adulteration. So this one, this portion focuses on um, potential contaminations of your food, like maybe someone coming into your plant or, or your workers coming and adding in food items or non-food items into your food and poisoning, you know, adding poison or adding body, like chemicals in where they shouldn't be. And, and, and um, also this would fall under sometimes economical hazards are, are caused, like say people or your company is trying to save money. And so you're, you're adding canola oil into olive oil to, to make a little bit more money or say you're, you're selling some kind of drink mix and you're adding something that might not be a food ingredient into your food. Um, so this, this program talks about harmful adulteration to your food. Then there is, if you are, I don't know if there's any pet food companies here, prevent, there's a separate section for preventive controls for animal food. So if you're making animal products, um, you, you would have other information. I'm not well versed on the animal food portion. And then also lastly, it includes the produce safety rules. And so this is for farms and packing houses, places that uh, are, you're, you're not processing the food, but it's mainly like cutting it from the farm, maybe washing, rinsing, and then selling. So all of this falls under the Food Safety Modernization Act. Since this is a packaged foods online course, um, we're gonna be focusing a little bit more on the requirements for preventive controls for human food. And um, that includes good manufacturing practices, hazard analysis, and having your hazard analysis with risks. Uh, making sure you have proper record keeping and supply chain. So if you are a registered, an FDA registered facility, you would have to go through, or someone in your facility would have to be familiar with FSMA and know this information for human food. And if you are a pet food company, um, you would need to know the information for the pets. And if you are a farm that's just selling regular produce, you would have to take a class on produce safety to learn about how to what you should be doing to produce safe food. We offer an online platform for producer, producers to sell their own products to local commercial and residential buyers. But just to clarify, as a food hub, we cannot purchase homemade products because we then correct, yes. So um, I guess it's like a aggregate, like a food hub. And so Technically, yes, they cannot sell. You, you're not supposed to resell homemade products um, out there in the market. Correct. I mean, I see people do it, um, but by, by law, you're not supposed to do it. Because you might, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know that. But if someone were to get sick from the homemade products, I think the liability might fall under your company too, if you're selling products that potentially harm people. Yeah, but don't quote me on that, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, okay, 
uh, Food Safety Modernization Act. So basically, yeah, like basically it's for ensuring that the food that you're making is safe. It's you're required to have a food safety plan if there are any hazards in your food. Um, also, if you that hazard analysis is in, required for it, and um, it's you're subject to FDA inspections. So the FDA could come in and inspect, ask for your food safety plan, and walk around your facility once you're registered. And it's dependent. I mean, the FDA does come to inspect facilities here, and usually they give you a heads up. Sometimes they might not, but people do get inspected. And um, your facility should have at least one preventive controls qualified individual. So this is someone who has the background or training of food safety, and they know how to produce a, a safe product. Okay, so when does FISMA not apply to you? And so the Food Safety Modernization Act does not apply to you if you're, you fall under other regulations, okay? So someone was asking, they're inspected by the USDA, most likely the food that they're making includes more than 2% of cooked meat or poultry or more than 3% raw meat. So now you're under the United States Department of Agriculture, their food safety inspection service. So you have another set of rules to deal with. And so you might, depending on what you're making, you might have a USDA inspector, like a, a desk for them to work at. And they come, depending on what your product is, they, they come and they check your your food item, so you fall under USDA. If you are working with seafood, you fall under seafood HACCP rules. Uh, and so a lot of these programs are similar, but this proceeds. If you do seafood HACCP, you're not required to, to do the, the um, FISMA, the Preventive Controls for Human Foods. Same with juice HACCP, you have your own rules to deal with. Dairy products, and then low acid canned foods, you have some other regulations that you have to, um, trainings and regulations that you need for to produce your food. Okay, and so, um, so in Hawaii in general, food produced in Hawaii is regulated by state law and some federal laws if, you, if you're a FDA registered facility. And then um, if you're going interstate, so now you're selling to the mainland or you're bringing in things from the mainland, you're, you fall under federal laws. And so it could be FDA, it could be USDA. Something to note too, if you are mailing food items here, this is something you should be doing. There's no real law about it, but this is good practice to make sure your foods are safe. If you have a food that you're, you're sending that requires temperature control, you want to make sure you adhere to time and temperature rules. So if you're selling chilled foods, you want to make sure it doesn't stay in the temperature danger zone. So it should be chilled at less than 41 degrees Fahrenheit for the whole duration. So if you know your shipment is 12 hours or 24 hours or 48 hours, you should have enough dry ice or ice gel packs to make sure that your food stays cold for an extended period of time. And also to do that, you would do like some studies internally with your company and like test it, leave it out in a box in the hot sun with your dry ice or your ice packs and time it and see, okay, is the internal temperature of my I don't know if you're saying meat or produce, is it still is it still cold? And so you should be doing those tests and keeping records so that you're verifying that my food is safe and it's I'm shipping it safely too. Okay, and so this only applies to if you need temperature controlled food. If you're sending cookies, granola, coffee, this you don't have to worry about it. But if it's something that should be chilled, you, you need to test it out and make sure it, it works. And and say you're using FedEx or something and it takes one day overnight shipping. You don't wanna aim for just 24 hours. You wanna aim for 
like 36 hours in case someone might not be home to accept the package right away. You want to have some leeway too, because if you send product and it doesn't stay chill, you know, you, you want to try to send the best quality product possible to your customers. I'll see more questions and answers. Are you responsible if somebody buys your product and then sells it to others? Oh, I don't know. Oh. Hmm. Okay, there's a question. Can you keep digital records? Yes, you can keep digital records. Um, are you responsible? That's a good question. Someone asked, are you responsible if someone buys your product and then sells it to other countries? And do you know they're selling it to other countries? Or someone asked a question, are, are, is this, um, I see products, brands from other countries. What is that? Do you sell products? Or are you responsible for selling by Orioles from China? Um, wait, so, so are you saying you're importing it in? So the first question someone's asked, are you responsible if someone buys? Like if I produce something in Hawaii and I, someone else sells it to other countries, um, then if you if you're if there's some kind of agreement and you know this is happening, then you're part of the responsibility. But say like you're selling it to me and now I'm I'm just buying it off your website and then now I'm selling it to another country. Technically, it shouldn't fall under you because I'm I took ownership of it and I'm selling it. But if we're in some kind of agreement and I'm a broker or something, then it might fall under you. But I have to, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know the exact answer of who's responsible. Yeah. Because I think once you sell it to the customer, that's your customer. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know. I don't know that answer. Does anyone else know that answer? Do you want to add it to the chat or the question box? I, I don't know the exact answer to this question someone asked. Sorry, Zoom too. Okay, let's see. Um, interstate commerce, now we're going on to mainland sales. So what do you need to do? Now you're selling online to people that live on the, in the continental United States. Um, so interstate commerce. So according to the Food and Drug Cosmetic app, so this falls under food too, uh, you are considered in interstate commerce if there's any commerce between any state or territory and any place outside. Um, even if you are doing commerce with the District of Columbia, which is a state that is considered um, interstate commerce. So this is where it's interesting here. Manufacturing, packaging, distribution of part of your product, if any of that occurs on the mainland, now you are considered interstate commerce. So say you're, you're buying something that's made in Washington state, and then you're getting it and you're selling it on your website. Um, that falls under interstate commerce. Or, or if you're buying a portion, like something's made in, like, yeah, you're buying packaging from the mainland and you're bringing it over here. You're fall, even though you might just be selling it in Hawaii, it's still considered interstate commerce because part of your product was made on the mainland. So, um, yeah, so a question, so say, say you're, say someone's making cookies in New York and now um, you're getting those cookies here and someone, and now you're selling it. Now that's considered interstate commerce. Yeah. Or, or say you're, they're making it in New York and you're selling it on your website and you never see it here. That's still considered interstate commerce. Um, so moving on, going back to this whole, do I need to register as an FDA food facility? And this is in regards to interstate commerce. Uh, if you are a farm and you're not producing processed foods, you're just selling fruit, it's not cut. Um, if you're a restaurant, if you're a retail food establishment, like a grocery store, um, if you're a home operator, you do not have to register your food facility. 
how about farm ingredients bought in the mainland and then product made in Hawaii? That's interstate commerce. Yes. You, if you bought it in the mainland. But if you're buying it from a distributor who bought it from the mainland, that's still, that's not interstate commerce. Does that make sense? But if you're buying directly from someone in the mainland, then you're considered in interstate commerce. So that answers your question. Anonymous attendee. Okay. So some of you might be like, yeah, I fall under this category. So you don't have to register. But um, <laughs> if you process, produce, pack, or hold foods for human consumption, or you now are part of interstate commerce, which I'm guessing a lot of you are since you are in this class, then yes, you have to register as a food facility under the FDA. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so you would have to register as a food facility. Okay, um, let's see if there's any questions about that. And then, so now let's talk about nutrition facts panels. So um, it's weird once you do interstate commerce, once you're selling, there's really no real regulations on nutrition facts on foods that you're selling online, depending on like sales, in your, your annual sales. So I, I'm assuming this is going to change in the next few years because really nutrition facts, your your display panel, everything is there to protect the consumer, but it's not really regulated right now. And I know it, when I was searching things up, it looks like people are starting to complain because you really want transparency. You want consumers to know what they're getting, but there's no real regulation on it. Um, so you might see a lot of food, packaged food items sold online that don't include the nutrition facts in these panels. Uh, again, going back to the state side, if you have a health claim like low fat, gluten free, um, no sodium, no trans fat, um, then or a nutrient claim, then you need a nutrition facts. And again, if a vendor asks for one, so if you want to get into a certain online market, they might ask you for one. Um, yeah, but really, if none of this applies to you, then you could get away with not having to list the nutrition facts on your website or on a package grid. And so these are the exemptions for labeling required in, in general. Okay, so um, yeah, there's no real rule, but if you fall under certain rules, then you, you would have to have a label. Um, so these are the exemptions for having nutrition facts. So the nutrition facts, if you've ever looked in the back of a, a food item, it's that little table with how much calories and fat and sodium, um, carbohydrates are in there. So if you sell less than $500,000 in annual gross sales of all products, so then you are exempt. So if you don't make $500,000 in selling, this is where the food, clothing, um, bags, if you're selling, um, postcard, something, if you make less than $500,000, you're exempt from having to put a nutrition facts label on your food item. Um, if you make less than $50,000 in annual gross sales of all your food products, then you don't have to have a label on your food item either. And then there's also a low volume exemption of your products. So if you have less than 100 full-time employees, and you sell less than 100,000 units annually, um, you don't have to have a nutrition label. And in regards to these 100,000 units, this is per SKU or per flavor. So say you are a party mix, you're making Chex Mix for your company, and you have like a cheddar Chex Mix, and you have a furikake Chex Mix, and you have a spicy one. So if you sell less than 100,000 units of each flavor, you could be exempt from having to put a label on. It's not 100 units, 100,000 units total for all the products you're selling. And for this exemption, you would have to file it with the FDA and send the letter and, and, and they would get back to you and, and you wouldn't have to put a nutrition tax on. Okay. But again, if a vendor asks for one, a distributor asks for one, like Whole Foods or something, then you would have to 
put it on. And if there is a health claim, nutrient claim, you would have to put a nutrition label on it. Not seeing any questions. Okay, so if you are shipping food items, which I think is probably the most common way people are, are shipping. So this is just some background on it. The United States Postal Service, you're not allowed to ship alcoholic beverages and you are allowed to use dry ice as a coolant in your, in your packaging. Um, UPS, no alcoholic beverages, perishable foods. So things that are gonna spoil. Um, plants, and there are exceptions to the rules, but that's in general the rules. Um, FedEx, what's not allowed, um, fresh foods like milk, cream, vegetables, fruit, and meat are not allowed via FedEx. And if the food is allowed with FedEx, you have to uh, make sure there's a bill of lading, and that includes information about like what the food is, how much does it weigh, and um, yeah, what, what ingredients does it contain, and then it needs to be packaged in FDA standards, making sure there's no leaks, making sure if it needs to be chilled, it's chilled um, and it will be chilled for the proper amount of time. And then um, if you have a certain license, you could ship alcohol through FedEx. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna keep on going in case, I, if you need a break. People can't do emojis on this. Okay, we're just gonna keep on going. Uh, moving on, so that was talking about just in general interstate regulations. And so that would apply to almost every state if you're shipping to the mainland. But then there's California and California is different from every other state. And there are talks that Washington state and New York state might implement uh, similar rules, but nothing has been set in stone yet to follow California's rules. But California has different uh, regulations too. So I'm gonna go over these if you plan to ship to, to California, okay? Okay, so for California, there's something called the Proposition 65 and this deals with additives and ingredients that you could put into your foods or happen to be there because of pesticides or um, equipment or packaging. And so this Proposition 65 in California state, um, it's a list, a huge list. If you want to get the list, it's over here. You can look at that, um, this, this link here. And um, it's got, I don't know how many, like, hundreds, <laughs> I want to say over a hundred chemicals that could be in food and they can cause cancer, breath defects, or cause reproductive harm. And so it's this huge list. And if your food contains these chemicals or in at a certain quantity and different ingredients are diff different chemicals have different quantities, um, you must add a warning to your food item that it says that it contains these chemicals. And some of them could be pesticides. It could be found in common household products, could be naturally occurring in some foods. It could be in some drugs, dyes, or solvents. Okay. So I'm going to be going over, I, I looked through the list and ones that I thought were more common, I added it to this presentation. It'd be good, if, especially if you have some kind of unknown chemicals or you're using a, different flavorings or colorings in your food or more chemicals, you might want to just check this list to make sure that your ingredient isn't on Prop 65. Or if you're making breads or cakes and you have dough conditioners in it, those could fall under um, Prop 65 also. So these are just some ones that I kind of pulled out. So certain colors, artificial colorings, so not all. So I, some of you might be using food colorings and a lot of them are considered safe and not cancer causing, but this I saw it's orange number 17, red eight, nine, and 19. Um, you would have to list it. Um, methyl chloride. And so sometimes it's used to remove caffeine and coffee. Sometimes it's used in spices. Um, potassium bromate, it's used if you're making any cakes, cookies, 
uh, breads, you might, this might be in one of, uh, you might be adding this to your product crackers. Um, silica crystalline, and so this is an anti-caking agent. So it could be found um, as a component in one of your ingredients that you're putting into your food. And this is different from silica gels. So you know how some of you might have these packets with these little beads in it? I've seen it in like nori, Korean nori. Um, that's a gel, so it's okay. But this crystalline one that's in food items, uh, that could be something to watch out for. Uh, sulfur dioxide. So a lot of times sulfur dioxide is found in dried fruits because it helps to maintain the color uh, and quality of the fruit. So that would have to be listed too. And then other ones too, aflatoxin. So it's a, it's a fungus found on peanuts, corn, and tree nuts. It's not always there, but here's just a picture of it. And so uh, that could be at high levels in your foods, depending. Uh, and so receiving documentations from your suppliers to make sure the aflatoxin levels are low, um, that would, then you wouldn't have to list it on your, on your product. Um, acrylamide, and we'll be going over this one in the next slide. So this one, it's a form chemical, and it's na it naturally occurs when there's a reaction with heat and sugar and an amino acid. And so this one might be more common in baked goods. Again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, alcoholic beverages, arsenic. So depending on if you have rice in your food, certain countries have more arsenic in their rice, and depending on the amount of rice or rice flour you're putting into your food item that might have too high levels. Um, some edible seaweed like hijiki, uh, they, depending on yeah, what country, there might be more arsenic in that. Um, cadmium, so depending on what fish, yeah, I don't know if any of these ones are like fish, fish jerky, something. Um, fish, shellfish, some organ meats and spinach might have the cadmium. Um, caffeic acid, so caffeine. So it's naturally occurring in some fruits and coffee and um, lead. So lead in the past was in some food colorings, but it could be in vinegar, chili, tamarind, uh, mercury in those big fish, big eye tuna, big fin tuna, and then tobacco in oral use of smokeless products. So the best way, what I would recommend is, yeah, look at this list, see if your food items contain any of the chemicals, look at the, look at the tolerable limits and um, ask your suppliers for their analytical testing on, on like cadmium or lead. So you have proof that your product doesn't contain the high levels of these amounts and then you'd be okay. But say you're not okay and <clears throat> your food has a higher amount of these chemicals, then you would have to list a warning on your website and um, on your packaging. Are there professional you can hire to help you with this? Oh, I, don't, I don't know. I'm sure there are. <laughs> I mean, but you could do it yourself too. You could go look at the list and, and depending on your product, you could see what ingredients are coming in and you can, you're usually when you are um, ordering ingredients, it should come with a, a COA, a certificate of analysis that has this information and you can see what the levels are. So you can make someone at your, your company do it too, so <laughs> uh, up to you. Um, but I, I, there's probably people out there that could help you with it. Okay, so acrylamide. So this is a big thing. I used to work at Frito-Lay on the mainland and we were always testing for acrylamide because it is found when um, things are fried, a lot of starchy items are fried or like baking bread. And so this like toast, picture of toast, it probably has acrylamide in it. And, and so it's formed when sugar and asparagine is reacting with heat. And so we would always have to go send our potato chips for testing. And so, I mean, if they're like super dark or like kettle chips, you wanna make sure that the acrylamide levels are low. So we, you would have to send out your product for testing to make sure that your acrylamide levels are, are, are low where it wouldn't have to be listed as a Prop 65 product. Uh, for California customers. And so there's rules of apparently if you fry your food in less than 338 degrees Fahrenheit, 
by the National Toxicology Program, then you shouldn't have as much. You should have lower levels of acrylamide. Um, yeah, if you're selling really burnt products, then you might want to get it tested or maybe don't go for that really dark golden brown and um, go for a little bit lighter but cooked um, coloring on your foods. And then um, really you're not supposed to consume more than point, uh, a food item shouldn't have more than 0.2 milligrams, micrograms, micrograms, sorry, micrograms of acrylamide. Um, you shouldn't consume that. You should consume less than 0.2 micrograms per day. And um, if your food has over 140 micrograms, I think I used the wrong one, but then uh, it would require a reproductive health warning on it. So yeah, there's, if you do any baked goods, cookies, crackers, breads, this is something that you might wanna just run a test, a quick test to see, okay, what are my acrylamide levels and are they low enough? And I looked, I looked online to look at like different kettle brand chips and I don't see the warning on it. So they must have gotten their time and temperature cooking so that their acrylamide levels are low. Okay, and so here's an example of a warning label or notes you could add to your website or your packaging of foods that you're going to sell to California customers. And so it's like warning, this product can expose you to chemicals including, and you would list, you would list the different chemicals um, that are on the Prop 65 list. And um, that's what you would have to list here. And then for more information, go to the P65 warnings um, and you list their website. So having something like this on your website would be uh, good so people know. Okay. If you have an online store or you know your, your website for your, for your company, you um, need to have a warning on it, but you would have to display it and you have different methods and options to display this warning. So it could be on your product display page. It could be sometimes, I read that sometimes people, when, when they're purchasing the food item and then the zip code pops up for shipping, then there's a pop-up warning that says, hey, you're a California resident. So here's the warning here. Um, you could put it on yeah, your packaging and I, I looked over here too, and um, this is what Amazon does. So when I was looking at food online at Amazon, it wasn't on every food item, but they had this whole safety information recalls section, and it had all this information specifically about California Proposition 65, and it had information about it um, there. And so um, this warning, it's the responsibility of the food producer, packager, or distributor, depending on who, actually it's probably all, um, to provide the warning. So if your distributor has your food, they should know and say, hey, do you have this warning? And they should know it's there. And then if you're selling to a distributor, um, it's the retail responsibility, the retail sale, seller's responsibility to put that warning up. So. I think that's why Amazon put theirs up because now they're considered the retail seller. And so they have to make sure that warning material is up on their, on their uh, website. Okay. Uh, thank you for putting up the links on the chat. And then, uh, so yeah, I mentioned there could be pop-up warnings that could display when you're buying, when. California residents are selling the food item, uh, but then some people also choose not to go with this route because um, the food could still go to someone in California. So even if you're not based in California, somehow this pop-up might not get through and there's chance for being sued. So they, um, they have the warning up on their website. Or I've seen some companies just choose not to sell to people in California. So you have that option too. Like you just, I, I've seen it on Amazon too when I try to buy lithium batteries or I try to buy these 
chargers for my phone, um, it won't ship to Hawaii. And so you can have something like that that says, sorry, we don't ship to people in California. But um, I did hear from other people too that, and I don't know how far this goes, uh, maybe too bad people can't voice in and chime in on this webinar, but I was told that some places here in Hawaii that have California tourists coming to Hawaii were asked, um, like, even if we're not doing interstate commerce and selling it online to put California residents, California residents are coming here. So technically they could consume the food bought in Hawaii that contains Prop 65 ingredients. And then they could be, now the, the company is liable. So I don't know to what extent, it's kind of crazy about how, it, I, I think these troll, I don't know what they're called, troll, troll lawyers who are coming out and they're trying to just sue everybody. But I know there were letters being sent out to food manufacturers here in Hawaii that were selling to another company that were selling to tourists that came to Hawaii. And I'm just like, how do you, how do you even control that? And so I don't know ever what happened with those letters, but I, I know it came to that point where, yeah, what if a lot of California people would travel to Hawaii and they might buy food here that they bring. So this was more big in about 2018 and I guess 19 and maybe after COVID hit. So um, I don't know, but it, 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 Amazon got hit by a lot of Target got hit too from companies. So um, I don't know. You, you have the option to choose not to sell to California, but if you do, because a lot of Hawaii people are transparent to California, then this is something that you should, you, you have to um, be aware of if your food items do contain those Prop 65 ingredients. And, and if they do, another option, you could reformulate. So say you're making bread, you don't have to use that dough conditioner. So you don't have those certain ingredients in your, in your food item. So yeah, only California um, for now. So just something to be aware of. Okay, and then I just have a couple slides for international sales here. And um, so it depends. So all of it, depending on what country you want to ship to, you have to, it's suggested you focus on a specific market and you learn the rules and regulations of that country because they're all different on what you're exporting out. And if you know you're going to certain countries, you wanna try to make it as user-friendly and maybe have, have your, um, the cost in the other countries' costs in, in their monetary unit. And then also um, wording, you know, not only English language, but the other countries' language too. So I would focus on certain countries that you're gonna to ship to. And um, you know, specifically Japan is really close by and a lot of people um, send things to Japan. So some tips about sending products over to Japan, like say you're just mailing it, you're not exporting it to a distributor, but if you're just mailing it, um, some rules for watch out is you want to make sure that your product is sealed and it's original packaging not tampered with. So you, you're not allowed to sell homemade foods, foods made in your home kitchen to Japan. Um, all the ingredients that you're using need to be listed on your package and the shelf life should be at least six months from the ship date. If not, it's considered um, perishable food and they won't accept it and it's not going to be, um, yeah, it's just gonna be sent back. So you, you wanna make sure ideally you want a greater than six month shelf life because unless you're buying it the day that someone produces it or something, yeah, it's, then it's considered perishable. And then you need to have a use by date listed on your food item. And in the United States, there's no real rule on having a use by or best by date on most food products. There's some on like baby food, baby formulas and certain other foods, but in general, you're not required to have a use by date on foods you produce. But if you're gonna send it to Japan, there should be a use by date. Um, from good practices, I recommend you put a use by date because if you don't, then any customer might buy a food item four years ago and send it and say, hey, the quality's off. And so, I want my money back. So 
I would recommend putting some kind of date on your product so that you're not responsible or liable if they get sick or it's gross. But by federal law, it's not required to have a use by date on most foods that you make here. How do you test or figure out a use by date? Um, so it depends on that one. And so what I recommend people do to create or determine their shelf life best by date is there's two issues that you're looking at, quality and safety. So from a quality standpoint, this could be it's getting stale. Um, the oil in it is going rancid. So it's got like that stink smell. Like if you've ever not used your cooking oil long enough and it has that kind of like turpentine kind of like that, that chemical smell okay your oil is going off or if you've left peanut butter for a long time it kind of has that like sickly fatty oily smell um so that's a quality issue you're not going to die from the food but it's going to not be as good like um canned food items there's the best there's a date on it and you know they, they have stories about people finding canned goods that expired 20 years ago and they eat it and it's safe but Maybe those green beans are now mushy. That's a quality issue. So I would first start off looking at your product and then determining the quality, how long the quality of your product lasts. So I'm gonna, for example, take cookies. Say I'm making these chocolate chip cookies. I'm gonna leave them in the packaging that I'm selling to someone, you know, the exact packaging. And then I'm going to, I, I'm gonna say, okay, I think my shelf life is a year. So I'm gonna make several bags of these cookies. And every month I'm going to, I'm going to put every month, I'm going to take a bag and put it in my freezer. And this is a real time test for quality. And so say I'm testing every month for 12 months, I'm going to have 12 different bags. And then I'm going to freeze it month one, month two, month three, month four, all the way to month 12. And then on the month 12, I'm going to take them all out of the freezer, defrost it. And then I'm going to cut up samples and get some friends or workers at my company and I'm going to have them blindly taste the cookies at all the different months. And I'm going to have them, so it's not labeled month one, it's, it's labeled like sample three, four, five, sample eight, seven, two. And they're gonna taste it and rate, does it taste good, what's not? And then I'll have an idea, I'll gather the data and at least you want, you want more than 10 people tasting it. And you compile your data and you can kind of see oh, from their rating, oh, it kind of tastes stale here or the texture's off. And then you can kind of say, okay, based on my data, oh, look, the cookies are good in, for 12 months. Or, oh, look, the cookies are not, they start tasting weird at three months. And so say these cookies are good up until six months, then I would take that data and now I have to go to a lab and, um, I would send it to a lab and they're going to test the cookies on micro testing. So they're gonna test water activity, pH, um, aerobic plate count, all these other tests. And then you're gonna get lab data that shows, okay, there's no growth. Um, and you, you tell them, I, I, from a quality standpoint, my cookies are good for six months. And then you have them test your cookies at different time intervals and then and then you see, okay, is it still safe? Is there microbial growth? And um, if there's not, then that's how you kind of determine your use by date. That's the that's the real, like I guess the scientific real-time way you do it. But a lot of times you would kind of look at your product and a lot of people look at their competitors and kind of guess on what their shelf life is. And then they go with it. Cause you don't have that enough time. You don't have a year or two put your product in the freezer and then send it to a lab for another year. So they have a good estimate. And cookies probably isn't the best example because cookies are pretty dry and they're gonna last for a long time. So it's more if you have a salad dressing or you have a, a dip or some kind of chocolate, um, those you might have to figure out the best buy or, um, yeah, that's, that's some ways to do it. Uh, do you know a website we can check for detailed Japan regulations? Uh, kind of. And then we, I did a presentation last month about exporting to Japan. So I don't know if HTDC has the 
recording of that. So maybe you can ask them for the recording um, for more regulations on what Japan expects from exports out to the Hawaii. And then can you name a lab or two that can do quality testing? Um, I would recommend you do your quality testing on your own so you can save money. But uh, if you're gonna do safety testing, there are a couple of labs in Hawaii. You can send it out to the mainland labs. I think a lot of people send to FQ labs and I think they're in like Wapuna Puna area, but they might be the only place. There might be another lab, but um, there's like water, water quality. And I'm not vouching for them, I don't know. I don't know them personally, but there's not a lot of labs, but I think a lot of people, that might be one of the few labs here or people send them out to the mainland. Oops, okay. Uh, let's see. And what else have we been talking about here? Okay, so are there any questions? I know people have been asking questions, but are there any other questions at the moment? And then um, you can keep on asking questions, but something to note too, um, and this class was scheduled because I will be teaching a FISMA preventive controls human foods course in April, so in a couple of weeks. And so if you think that you're gonna be coming a FDA registered food facility, you would need a preventive controls qualified individual in your team. Some people farm it out to a consultant, but I always recommend it's good to have someone in-house else you're paying that consultant every time they have to come in to help you. And so it's gonna be virtual online via Zoom through Hawaii HCDC. And it's every day, five days that week um, for about four hours a day. And then after you finish the class, um, you will become a preventive controls qualified individual. And the course is, $650 and if you finish the course and you fill in the paperwork, it's you get $325 back. And so um, I think there's only 14 spots, six, I think there's only 14 or 15 spots. And I know that a bunch have already been filled, but I, I think there's still spots available if you're interested and, and you don't, if this is down the line, you don't have to do this until later. I think they're going to offer another class in October or maybe the fall. I'm, I'm not sure. It's kind of scheduled when people need the class. Um, oh, yes. Uh, I just want to chime in um, for the online FISMA class. It's you still have a chance to sign up. I'm closing the registration on the 6th just to get the ETF um, subsidy, the 50% forms into the DLIR office in time. But right now we have like four spots left. So I think it's just a good opportunity for those two who are interested and to get the, basically the class half off. So yeah, I just wanted to chime in. So uh, it, it's good to have someone ask, is this good for other states? Yes, it is. So this is for, it's an F, I don't know if it's FDA approved, but the F, the Food and Drug Administration worked with this other group to create the curriculum for this class. So uh, unfortunately it's kind of long and I have to go through certain slides because uh, that's what's required. And so it's, it's a good background. And ideally the person coming to the class should have some food safety background or knowledge too so they understand what's going on because we'll talk about some biological hazards, chemical hazards and other things. So um, yeah, we, we are offering that. Um, if you're just doing home use, homemade, you don't have to go to this class. Uh, it's more if you are a FDA registered facility, someone in your facility should have a preventive controls um, PCQI certificate or um, a lot of years of training. So it's not required if you have someone who's so who's knowledgeable, has years of experience, that can be justified to this. So it's not really, really required, it's just recommended. Um, would we need a FISMA class if we're making it? No, no, most likely not. You don't need 
the FISMA class if you're at USDA facility, unless some of your other products fall under, um, they, they don't fall under USDA. And it's good to have, but I, you have your own regulations for USDA. Uh, where can we find out regulations about using alcohol in our product? Um, oh, you mean for shipping or? I don't know if there's a lot of, like what percentage of alcohol, it depends on what percentage of alcohol you're using. I think you're allowed to use alcohol and plus you're probably cooking it off anyway, right? So I think you can use alcohol in your product. You're not making an alcohol, right? Like the brewery should know, like, are you adding, are you adding your hot sauce to their wine or are you just adding some wine to your hot sauce? Cause it should be okay. It's just considered an ingredient in your product. Are there any other questions? Oh, uh, she followed up um, by saying she's not making alcohol. She's adding wine and beer to the hot sauce. Okay, I think the there's no real regulations on that. So you can just add it to your product. Well, thank you for joining this oh. webinar and I'll stay on for a while, so. Yeah, uh, we have one more question that came in since we have some time. Uh, do you have a HCCAP class or uh, classes? Um, right now, I know that in HCDC, Wayne La Yugen, if people ask for it, then he puts you in contact with people doing HACCP on the mainland. And so you can take a webinar class through through HCDC. They, they, they find experts in certain um, topics and they have people so they they do os offer HACCP classes. Um, I am a lead instructor in HACCP but I haven't um, created my curriculum for it yet so I can't offer that class yet but um, I know Wayne has has organized things for other people. Okay is there any more questions? We've got around seven minutes left, but um, I guess as you guys uh, think about some questions or if you have any, um, I just wanted to do a quick like shout out. Um, if you are a Hawaii based company that is looking to expand your customer base through e-commerce and optimize online sales through digital marketing, uh, please check out Innovate Hawaii's cohort five. Um, there are just a variety of topics that will be covered in those classes, such as SEO fundamentals, um, Google analytics, and um, much more. So for details, um, Laura, just put it in the chat. Um, uh, just check out our website at www.htdc.org slash cohort five. And again, for the FISMA train, online FISMA training, um, the registration closes on Wednesday. And if you do decide to sign up, once you sign up, um, our team will uh, get a notification and we'll send you the ETF form um, for the subsidies. Uh, so yeah, if you are interested, please check it out. Uh, I also left it the registration link in the chat, I can um, put it one more time for those who are interested. Uh, yeah, do you have anything else, Lauren? Um, no, but I can stay here too. Okay. I have questions or they're waiting for others to leave. But... Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, we can just wait a bit since we have five minutes left, but yeah, some of the questions. Oh. Oh, there's one more that came in. Are sending fresh fruit to the mainland protocol? Oh, okay. Um, it depends. What kind of fruit is it? Does it need to be fresh? Or is it all kinds of fruits? I would have to answer this one. Oh. 
I mean, I, I, I know more about processed foods than foods. So, is there, is there a way to get people's email to respond to them if I don't have the answers right away? Um, let me see. I can try after to pull up um, something like the report from Zoom, but we can, I can email you about it and then we can just discuss how to get the- I have to get back to you on the food, um, sending it to the moon because there's different rules on fruit being sent and um, if it needs to be refrigerated if it needs, mm -hmm. and, and other, other issues too with it. And, um, yeah, so. I have to get back to you on the sending of food. Veggie, peppers, I see. Okay. Yeah, send me an email. The, um, High sugar citric acid. Okay. Your bottling though, bottling should be commercial kitchen. You're heat treating it when you're bottling it. Yeah. Pretty sure that one falls under commercial, but I'll get back to you. I mean. Because you're adding acid, your fruits naturally don't have, your serves don't naturally have um, acid, right? You're adding acid, it's acidified. And the syrup is, yeah. Okay. I think citric acid and sugar. Okay. I send me an email. If, if, and, yeah, I don't, hopefully we'll get your contact information. And if not, send me an email here and then I'll, I'll look up information and let you all know. Mm -hmm. um, pretty certain. Oh. Well, if you're gonna, if you're gonna just, for this, for this syrup person, um, are you just selling it directly to people in Hawaii? Or are you looking to sell online and do interstate commerce? Or, yeah. Yes, and hopefully so. Oh, did you see? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, there's also an, another question that came through the chat. This should be the last one. But uh, when are food handlers required to wear a mask again? Oh, there's a mask question. I don't see that. Uh, it's in the. It's in, like in the chat. It's not in the Q and A. Oh. Um. I don't know on the mask mandate. I mean, right now, if it's a closed, every, everything's so different, right? <laughs> like I know at our school, we're not at, at KCC where we have to wear masks in the classroom because there's no set guideline on how far away your workers are from each other. So you can, I think you can make your own rules. You know, what are the rules? I, I, that's not a, um, you'd have to look at the state regulations for for the um, mask mandate you know, mm -hmm. and find out. And, um, but I think you can make your own, if you're, if you're more concerned, can they wear catering mask shields? Um, it's a catering mask shield, is that just a plastic one? I don't think you're, I mean, if it's your company, you can make them wear masks because you're private and so you could do it, but if you, I mean, it, it goes both ways. Some people are like, let's get these masks off. And some people are like, I'm more careful and cautious, but you're private. So if, if it is a matter of keeping the masks on, you can mandate it in your facility. And um, especially if people are close by each other, you can you can do whatever because it's your property and you can you can put you can wear masks, but um, by state rules. And, and that's like looking up to see what the state says, because uh, like Department of Education, they're pretty conservative. UH is conservative on our masking, but um, private can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. uh, so Lauren, uh, we're about to hit, or we're at 11 
um, a.m. now. So I would just want to say that if you would like to get in contact with Lauren, I believe the best way to, um, you know, she has her email information up here, but also if you want to reach out, we can through info at httc.org, we can connect you through there um, to Lauren. And someone asked a question about Department of Health. Are you not, um, about a food facility, FDA food facility. Uh, you, oh, sorry, not Department of Health. Who do you contact? Uh, there is a website, and then you can fill out the forms. Here, let me see if I can find it really quick. And so I think this is where you would have to register online. Okay, so it's all online and it's filling out information and then you're gonna be given a, a certain facility code for your, your facility. And if you have multiple plants or locations, you would have to register both of them. Okay. Thank you again, Lauren, and for everyone who joined us today. If you are interested in services from Innovate Hawaii, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. So again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And please email me if you have questions. Mm -hmm. Thanks.